a world of free-flowing trade with America at the helm. For decades, we've taken the principle of US-powered globalization as a given. But recent events have called that into question. It is striking not only how much has happened over the last five, six years, but also how much of it has been directed against the globalization of the economy. From rising populism to a global pandemic and war in Europe, the consequences are already biting. We've got stagflation, trade autarky, trade wars, war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult global environment for everyone, actually. Never before has the post-war economic order been on such shaky ground. Putin is a, uh, you know, he wants to get rid of the status quo. In this video, we'll unravel some of the threads of what is an increasingly tangled story. We'll look at the complicated relationship between the United States and China. When China says win-win, it often means China wants to win twice. How geopolitical conflicts and crises are reforging alliances. Beijing, uh, under Xi Jinping has seen Putin as um, allied in their common resentment of the United States. And how some countries are finding themselves in a tricky balancing act between friends and foes. This is a big, big issue for India. It's a, it's a, it's a survival issue. That's all coming up on Business Beyond. So if we are on the brink of a major shift in the global economic order, it's worth taking a look at the system that many people want to leave behind. For the best part of a century, the United States has been the world's undisputed economic superpower. After World War II, it experienced enormous growth, driven by rampant consumerism and a growing faith in free enterprise. The fall of communism in 1989 further solidified faith in a Western-led system. Economic barriers fell as countries rushed to fill demand in an ever more connected global marketplace. The effect on world trade was dramatic. In 1950, it stood at $63 billion. Within 10 years, that figure had more than doubled. And by 1990, it had multiplied 30-fold to $3.5 trillion. In 2020, it stood at more than $17 trillion. But in recent years, we've seen a backlash against globalization. And many economists think it was the global financial crisis that set the stage for the shift we're seeing today. The whole model, our capitalist model, I mean, maybe with more social characteristics in Europe, but still was put, um, was tested. And uh, the, the reading of the global south certainly China, but even Russia, was that our model was uh, fragile, very fragile. The financial crisis was followed a few years later by a rise in both populism and authoritarianism around the world. When you look at Trump especially, and not only the rise of China, but China under Xi being more aggressive abroad and aggressive internally, you've got a very different context now than we had even 10 years ago. When it comes to shifting power dynamics on the global economic stage, no story can rival that of the United States and China. In 1980, China's GDP accounted for less than 3% of total global output, with the US accounting for more than a third. Since then, it's played an extraordinary game of catch up, the US share of global GDP has fallen to less than 25%, with China now accounting for over 18%. With the gap between the United States and China getting ever smaller, it's worth asking, what does Beijing actually want? China would like to be in the position that it has been historically, way back in the day, where it was the center of the world and others interacted with China in a way that uh, gave China deference and China could uh, keep everything under control and have it go their way. Claire Reed negotiated for the US on trade with China from 2006 to 2014. 
She says China's long-term goal is to dominate future-proof industries like artificial intelligence, semiconductor chips, and pharmaceuticals. All of those sectors have been flagged as critical priorities for the Chinese, where they would like to become globally dominant. And if they have dominance in a number of industries so that they can set the terms with their uh, neighbors and trading partners, that's perfect. China's economic strategy has also become global through its Belt and Road program, a major infrastructure investment drive worth several trillion dollars. But economic influence is about more than just raw numbers. China has not acquired the structural power. Uh, United States still has the structural power across the globe. Uh, and I'm not very sure whether China is crossing the Rubicon uh, on this front. For China to acquire the kind of international influence the U.S. has had for decades, it will need to deepen its relationships. Although not a formal alliance, the BRICS, that's Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, has attracted some attention. The group brings together five emerging economies that team up to support each other's economic interests. And when it comes to challenging U.S. dominance, clubbing together does make a difference, symbolically at least. Well, you know, they, they, it's a, a marriage of convenience. It's, it's, a, it's a useful alternative body. Uh, all the individual countries have got their own kind of problems. The BRICS is a good forum to talk about stuff. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, in the end, it, it's not, I think, an alternative to sort of the global, the global economy, the global trading system. Uh, it's not an alternative to, to trading and doing business with, with developed Western, Western markets, really. While the United States alone is still the world's largest economy with 24% of global GDP, China, India, Brazil, Russia and South Africa now together account for about the same share. In China, the state-run media has praised the BRICS alliance for boosting what it calls non-Western styles of multilateralism. At the group's most recent meeting in Beijing in June 2022, President Xi Jinping talked up its collective strength. Human history sure. will keep surging forward like a river, with moments of both calm waters and huge waves. Despite changes in an evolving global environment, the historical trend of openness and development will not reverse course. Our shared desire to meet challenges together through cooperation will remain as strong as ever. But alliances don't guarantee harmony. The relationship between China and India, both BRICS members, is a good case in point. Home to 1.4 billion people, India is the world's fastest growing big economy. But its relationship with China is currently overshadowed by a fractious border dispute. Tens of thousands of soldiers from both sides are stationed on the more than 3,000 kilometer long border hardly a solid foundation for an ever-deepening economic union. So we should say that this is actually an armed stalemate uh, at the moment. Uh, and this is also spilling over in political, economic, uh, strategic issues as well. To make things even more complicated, India's relationship with the United States has warmed considerably in recent years. The US recently overtook China as India's biggest trade partner. It also buys more from the country than it sells, a rare example of a trade surplus for India. No surprise then that India has been courted by the US as part of its own trade standoff with China. It's part of the new US-led Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, a free trade pact of 14 mostly Asian nations which excludes China. The Indian-Chinese relationship isn't the only complicated one within BRICS. India is also facing a tricky balancing act in its relations with Russia. Its failure to take a clear stance on the war in Ukraine and its decision to buy more Russian energy have raised eyebrows. But commentators point out that historically, sales of Russian gas to Europe have been far more significant. 
and that criticism of India's purchases this year are being taken out of context. This year is an exception, uh, but if you look at the last 70 years, uh, the total imports is no more than a billion or two at the most. Uh, while India imports something like a hundred billion dollars from the Middle East. Uh, so nowhere in proportion as when we say uh, the Russian energy component uh, in the Indian energy basket. So I think it is an exaggeration, uh, probably uh, lack of information. Questions of energy dependence have come to the fore since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As European countries rush to lessen their dependence on Russian gas and Western sanctions aim to cut Moscow out of the financial system, it's no wonder that Vladimir Putin is among those pushing hard for an alternate order. Over the past decades, new powerful centres have been formed on the planet and are declaring themselves louder and louder. Each of them develops its own political systems and public institutions, implements its own models of economic growth, and of course has the right to protect them to ensure national sovereignty. But the war in Ukraine has put pressure on countries that may have been ready to align themselves with Russia. Shortly before the war, China and Russia declared that there were no limits to their strategic partnership. But so far, there's little evidence that China is willing to break Western sanctions on Russia. China is a, a, an interesting one. I mean, you know, uh, Russia made a lot about that relationship. They're continuing to buy energy uh, and commodities and, and where they can negotiate a good deal for the Russians, they're doing it. But they're not going out of their way to help the Russians through financing or, uh, you know, uh, pr provision of arms, etc. But Russia and China's growing bond under the leadership of Putin and Xi does appear to have one watertight element, joint opposition to a US-led global order. Beijing, uh, under Xi Jinping, has seen Putin as um, allied in their common resentment of the United States and the US uh, global leadership as, as a superpower and what they see as interference in their domestic internal affairs, uh, criticism of their political systems, pressure to uh, change their economies, uh, fix address human rights, etc. And so that alignment has probably gone further than most expected. China may want the United States to stay out of its business, but the reality is the two countries' economies are deeply entangled. Despite the tensions of recent years which saw the countries slap tariffs on each other's goods, China and the US remain each other's biggest individual trading partners. US trade with China has grown dramatically in recent decades. But as you can see here, it's an uneven relationship, with the United States importing far more from China than it exports. That has led to calls for the United States to decouple. In other words, disentangle itself from China. But is that realistic? If the United States tried to decouple entirely from China, it would be very harmful to our economy. Uh, it would probably be harmful to our innovation. It would uh, just have other economies, uh, industries step in where the United States stepped out. Uh, so it wouldn't work. Decoupling probably wouldn't be a very good idea for China either. China also knows that its larger economic fate lies with the rest of the world. Um, and even though it has this tense relationship with the United States and others, uh, it is, um, uh, you know, most of its economic growth has been dependent on globalization with the rest of the world. It needs to find a way to balance those things. And so they are struggling. I think that is why China has, I think for the most part, as far as we can tell, abided by Western sanctions on Russia. At the beginning of this video, we asked whether we're at the dawn of a new global economic age. Trying to achieve some All of the experts we spoke to believe we're at an inflection point. But they emphasize this may not necessarily lead to the emergence of one system over another. If 
it's a case of a US versus a Chinese-led system, the differences are major. The market-led system of the US favours a lack of government intervention. The Chinese system favours heavy state involvement. They have reinvigorated support for state-owned enterprises, really focused on indigenizing technology, achieving, trying to achieve self-reliance. Uh, not done what previous leaders have done in trying to manage and maintain a, a healthier, uh, constructive relationship with the United States and the West. And so when I'm talking about what kind of order China would like, it's really what kind of order a Xi Jinping led China would like, which is a world safe for state capitalist authoritarian systems. But that system is always likely to have powerful enemies. I think it is really China, China's presence on the scene definitely uh, pulverizes the old post um, Cold War landscape and chessboard for sure. But the question is really uh, how does the rebalancing occur and how does it take place? And, and I would say that China has through its very strong authoritarian actions and its uh, actions vis-a-vis -vis the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and its actions vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kong uh, has, it, it has demonstrated political uh, viewpoints and, and a sense of what it believes is the way to go that is not appealing to large segments of, you know, liberal market economies across the world. So could opposition to a Chinese-inspired protectionist order be strong enough to push back the tide? I think it's a realistic hope that there could be a backlash to the backlash, that large numbers of people, maybe even a clear majority in many countries, will realize that nationalism and protectionism and rivalry and closedness is all worse for them than being more open, more engaged with the world around them. And having political bullies is worse than signing up to global rules. As for the people making those rules, this is a critical moment. If one part of the world, and I think we've, we've been told loud and clear, wants to change the global order, and this is not only Russia, this is China too, we need to listen. The turmoil unleashed by the global financial crisis of 2008 and 9, and more recently the pandemic and war in Ukraine, has laid bare a new truth. Blind faith in globalization has come to an end. We'd love to know whether you think the global economic order is changing. Let us know in the comments. And if you like what you see here, do check out our Business Beyond playlist. A good place to start would be our recent video on the global food crisis. Thanks so much for watching and until next time, take care.